All right, you stretch your legs, you drink some water, you're good. All right, let's continue on with chapter 17. So when I left off, we had just started to talk about what property rights mean and the big picture of these externalities. Remember that externalities are these little bits of cost or benefit that are happening externally to someone outside of that transaction, right? So if I'm purchasing something or I'm selling something, this is the additional cost or benefits that are happening to people outside of the system. So we started to talk about different ways to correct for this. One of them is by defining property rights. If you know who owns the river, then it's a lot easier to negotiate um, uh, coming to an agreement about pollution in the river. If the company owns the river, then they can rent out houses along it. They could not. The people in those houses could pay them not to pollute the river. Um, they could come to some sort of arrangement. If the people own the river, the company can come in and maybe like pay them a fee every month to try to pollute the river. Or they could just tell them no to polluting the river. These are different ways that we can get to a more efficient outcome by working together. Now, the way that we work together is by something called the Coase Theorem. So Robert Coase, back in 1952, if I'm not mistaken, came up with this brilliant, cool idea. And it was the idea that we don't necessarily need government intervention in every single decision, right? Sometimes we can work out an optimal or efficient solution by ourselves. We just need a couple key pieces. We first need transaction costs to be low. This means that people can negotiate together fairly easily. In the example that we've been using of someone in a factory and people living in the houses, if you can bring together the people in the houses and sit down and have a meeting with that person at the factory, you're all located relatively close to each other, it's a little bit easier for you to do. So these transaction costs are relatively low. Um, that's not the same as if someone like lived on the other side of the country or if 36 different people owned rights to this river and they didn't all speak the same language and they're far away from each other. Those transaction costs to communicate would be high. But in this, we're talking about transaction costs that are relatively low. A second thing that we need is well-defined property rights. In the example of, of the river, we need to know who the river belongs to. That's the first step into being able to understand or communicate together to come to an optimal or efficient solution. The third thing is a low number of participants. So we need enough people that we can reasonably coordinate them. If I needed the opinion of every person in the United States, that's 320 million people, that's hard to coordinate. If instead it's a few dozen people that live in a neighborhood, that's much easier to coordinate. So the Coase theorem says that we can come to a viable, efficient solution uh, you know, with, without outside intervention, if we have a couple specific pieces, um, that transaction costs are low, that, that there's well-defined property rights, and there's a small number of participants. When we start to get a large number of participants um, and the externality and transaction costs are really high and we start to get a lot of inefficiencies, then it's much more difficult for us as individuals to come to a solution. And that's when instead we need an intermediary or someone who's a little bit better at being able to coordinate the wants of the people and the wants of the companies together. So that, that's what the point of when we start to need government is when one of these three pieces are violated, the small number of participants, the well-defined property rights, or the um, low transaction cost. So let's go in and let's go back to thinking about negative externalities. Remember that we have our negative production externality. These are bad things that are happening externally or costs that are happening externally from producing something. We also have our negative consumption externality. These are the little bits of bad that are happening to society from us consuming a good or service. So let's talk about negative externalities. Um, let's say that there's pollution, right? So maybe this is a production externality. We're the steel company and maybe we're polluting the river or maybe we are a paper meal and we are causing deforestation and bad problems with CO2. Well, we have a couple things that we can do to try to correct for that, right? We can like mandate clean technology. We can say, hey, you have to use clean technology. Um, when property rights are really difficult to define, like who necessarily owns the clean air or who necessarily owns the river, sometimes it's hard to enforce public choices. So we can't necessarily say, oh, well, you can only produce 
so much bad stuff in the air and you have to like compensate these people who are affected by the bad air that's kind of hard that's hard to rationalize and that's hard to find everybody and come up with a decent understanding of cost about so sometimes in situations like that where it's difficult to define or enforce these things then we end up having regulation those are the sort of government responses that we have in those cases it's going to be the idea of saying hey you have to put a scrubber on your smokestack or you have to do something else another really cool idea and i think this one's just so neat is the idea of kind of either a tax or a cap and price pollution system so let's talk a little bit more about each of those oops Let's talk about taxes. So we know that our marginal social cost is the difference in between our private marginal cost plus this external cost that's happening, the effect or the cost that's happening to society that's not involved immediately in that transaction. Now, what a really interesting thing that a government can do if we have a really good understanding of the cost and benefits is setting a tax equal to this marginal external cost. If I know that, for example, I, like if it was just me, I'd want to like, they cost me about a dollar to make the paint per can at 3 million cans. I want to sell it for about a dollar. But let's say we knew that the, the cost to society was 75 cents. Well, then I might say, okay, well, you can do that. You can do that. You, you can sell that paint at a dollar and then we're going to tax you 75 cents on top of it. Well, then the company might be like, oh, well, that's going to make me like change my prices. Maybe, maybe I'm gonna have to raise my price a little bit and I'm gonna have to produce less of it. Installing these taxes to try to make it so that quantity and price adjust closer to the socially optimal level. When we have a tax that's equal to what that marginal external cost is, this is called a Pigovian tax. This was created by author Pago. He's a British economist uh, back in, I guess the late 1700s, early 1800s. And it's just a fascinating idea of a tax system that we can create. And this then we don't have to tell the companies to clean to clean up their mess. We don't have to tell people that they have to negotiate. What we instead say, if we have a really, really good understanding of cost, which is a strong assumption to make, but if we have a good understanding of cost and benefit, then we can say, you know what, we're going to tax you equal to the damage that you're doing to the environment. If you're taxing someone equal to the damage they do to the environment, they could just pay to not create that issue for the environment, right? Maybe they could raise prices and reduce reduce their quantity, which is the entire thing that we would see in between the private equilibrium and the socially efficient equilibrium. So for example, so we have our marginal cost, this blue line down here at the bottom, and it, it does intersect with this marginal social benefit. But we see if we consider the marginal social cost, we would actually produce less. What the idea of Pagovian taxes is, is that we include a tax so that for example, the supply curve, the orange supply curve that's on top is now equal to our marginal cost plus the amount of this tax. Remember the tax is equal to the marginal external cost. Well, the marginal external cost in the form of a tax plus the marginal cost, that means that the cost to these producers is now equal to this marginal social cost. Well, if it's now equal to this marginal social cost, we've shifted their cost structure. And when we shift their cost structure, that means that they're gonna to get to the efficient market equilibrium because now they're internalizing that equilibrium. They now have a new cost that's associated with it. So they're going to want to raise prices and reduce quantity and stop polluting as much. And we do that by installing in a tax. Isn't, isn't that cool? That's just, that, that's pretty neat. It's one way to get to the efficient market equilibrium is by having this sort of pollution tax. And then the government uh, collects tax revenue that they do something with. So then the next idea is the cap and trade idea. So remember I had said taxes or cap and trade earlier. A cap is the idea of an upper limit of pollution. Let's say that we know as a society, we can reasonably clean up about 600 trucks worth of pollution into this river. We can reasonably clean it up and not be too expensive. Okay, well, maybe Maybe at that point, what I do is I decide, okay, well, my the upper limit of pollution is now 600 trucks. We will not accept anything more than 600 trucks. 601, oh no, we are going to fine you until the cows come home. We are not getting to 601. We are staying at 600. It is the upper limit of our acceptable pollution. Well, when the government does that, 
when they use this method, they, they first have to figure out what about the efficient quantity would be. In our example, it was what, 2 million gallons of paint. Uh, so that's some sort of upper limit or the 600, you know, uh, trucks, uh, trucks of pollution. And once we have that, we can set an overall cap. Well, this means that we will get to the efficient allocation through a quantity regulation instead of a price regulation. Taxes and subsidies affect price. But quantity regulations, so this, is, this is quotas, they affect what the quantity level is going to be. So do I have a picture of that? Oh, I guess I don't have a picture of that. So with, with this cap and trade, what we do is we make a cap on the amount of pollution and then we go around to everyone and we give them pollution permits. Hey, firm number one, we, we will take 600 trucks of, of pollution. You have a right to 50. Here's your coupon for 50. Uh, plant number two, here's your coupon for 50. Uh, plant number three, here's your coupon for 50. You all can trade them if you want, but don't go over 600. The firms come together and the one that can turn to the clean technology for the cheapest says, hmm, I know there's a dirty firm over there and they can't necessarily switch to the clean technology. You know, I got 50 permits. I can switch to the clean technology pretty cheap. How about I'll sell you these 50 permits so that you can pollute more because you know, you're know you a dirty company and you need to be able to pollute more. But you gotta pay me like a million dollars for each one of these permits. That goes to the dirty firm. The cleaner firm ends up reducing their pollution. The dirtier firm can produce a little bit more pollution but they paid a big cost for that, right? It's a way of distributing the pollution among the firms. But what do we notice? that the cap is still 600. There's still a total amount of pollution that they can have. We're just allowing them to have these tradable permits that they can trade amongst each other. So we set a cap on pollution and allow people to trade their, their um, permits for pollution, right? This can come to the same outcome as the Pigovian tax because now the prices that some of these companies have to pay to be able to pollute is going to be similar to what that difference in between their marginal costs and the marginal social cost is. It pushes us closer to that marginal social cost line. And we get to an efficient outcome. So what about global externalities? So if, if one company or one country is producing, how does that affect other countries producing pollution? If, if we decide to pollute everything we possibly want, that affects the ozone. Well, the ozone affects every country, not just our country who polluted. So sometimes we have to think about what does this mean on a global scale? The United States has made its own air cleaner by adopting some of the measures that we just saw. We put in cap and trade systems. We, we put in these taxes to try to correct for things. But to solve the global global warming problem requires public choices that are global. You have to get lots of people working together on these sort of different climate issues if you're going to come up with this. Now, lower CO2 concentration in the world's atmosphere is a global public good, right? If you stop polluting, it's technically better for everyone if you stop polluting. Um, but that means that there's also free rider problems. What free rider problems are is that means, okay, well, we're telling everyone it's good if they don't pollute. Well, maybe, maybe I still pollute. Maybe I decide to pollute and all the other countries get clean. Then I get to enjoy a cleaner world, but I still get to pollute, right? Now, what if everybody started thinking like this? This is called the free rider problem of, oh, well, everybody else is gonna clean up, so why do I need to clean up? And that, that right there is why we have public economics. It's trying to figure out how, how can we affect markets so that these free rider problems don't happen? Right. If you think that these are just really fun to think about, by the way, take my public class. It's so much fun. We just play games and think about this all day. So, so let's think about the environment. Well, if, if no one really wants to take the cost of fixing the environment, then they're just going to keep polluting it and the environment's eventually going to go bad um, or, or be unsustainable. Well, what about other things? Maybe overfishing. Let's think about Atlantic cod, right? The Atlantic cod and the Pacific yellowfin tuna and the South Pacific whales and a bunch of other things, they tend to get overfished all the time. Why is this? Well, that's because they're a common resource. Remember, if we go back to the earlier chapter, a common resource means that I can't exclude anyone from using it. It's a non-excludable good. So I can't stop anybody from going and fishing in the ocean, but it is rival. If there's only so many fish, 
then if everybody comes in and fishes all the fish and then they leave, then the next period, there's not nearly as many fish for people, right? This is the idea that sometimes we call it the tragedy of the commons. For common resource goods, there might be an overuse of this common resource good that happens because there's not really an incentive to conserve it, or there's not really a conserve or an incentive to use it sustainably. So this is just unsustainable and inefficient uses of common resources. This is the idea of overhunting, overfishing, um, depleting the ozone because you don't really have an excuse to like not deplete the ozone, lots of other things. We call these the tragedy of the commons. So the, this unsustainable use of a common resource, well, there's many renewable common resources, right? Um, fish give birth to new fish and they grow and now there's new fish in the population which will in turn give birth to new fish and then there's new fish in the population um water sources uh you know we can use out some water sources and and water will continue off into the ocean and then there's clouds and the clouds come back over and then they rain and there's more water there it kind of replenishes over time there's lots of things like this a common resource is being used unsustainably is if we use it at a rate that's higher than this replenishment. So maybe we know that we can all go fishing, but if we only take this many fish, then these fish can still repopulate to that many fish in the next period. Maybe we know if we only use so much water, then in the next period, the rain will come in and we'll be able to have a full supply of water again. Sometimes if, if we're using these even faster than that, if we're using the water faster than it replenishes it, if we're, if we're fishing out all the fish faster than the fish can replenish, then we are using something unsustainably. Sustainably means that we're still using it. We're, we're still fishing. We're still taking out water. We're still kind of depleting the ozone, but we're doing it at a rate that's less than its ability to heal itself or its ability to repopulate. So that's kind of the difference in how in econ we think about the idea of being unsustainable versus sustainable. So we think about the negative externalities of the tragedy in the comments. We're gonna go back to fish because I don't know, I like talking about fish. I actually have a friend who's like working on like, I have one that's working on Norwegian fishing uh, and overfishing issues. And then I have another one working on Alaskan overfishing issues. And it's just really weird to see how their research has become so similar, even if they don't know each other. So let's see that this is the sustainability curve, sustainable catch curve, right? So maybe, maybe we can catch different amounts of fish and maybe there's like different levels of fish. So if, if we're right here, then everything's super sustainable, like it, it's continuing. If we're right here, maybe around like 250 on the left-hand side, if we take 10 million uh, fish and we catch about 250 a day, maybe that's sustainable. Maybe they can replenish themselves. There'll be enough fish left over to continue to have fish. Maybe until we get to this top. This is at 20 million tons of fish and 300 tons of fish caught per year. Well, maybe at that level, that's kind of our maximum sustainable amount that we can catch. At that point, the fish can replenish themselves each year, but it's getting really tight. They're not getting any extra fish. They're just refilling the fish. Once we go past that, say for example, if we keep a stock of 35 million fish at, and catch 150,000 a day, um, then at that point, we take out a bunch of fish and then there's less fish. They kind of they kind of replenish some. And then we take out a bunch of fish and then there's some fish and they replenish some. We we get rid of the fish faster than what we can we can get them back, right? So we have two different places here. We have an unsustainable range and a sustainable range. If we're in the sustainable range, that means that the stock of fish is growing. If we're in the unsustainable range, that means the stock of fish is sink or shrinking in between time periods where there's less and less fish in society for us to be able to catch. This, this right here is the tragedy of the commons. It's the idea that sometimes we use things unsustainably and that's a problem. So how do we correct for them? And that's the entire purpose of public economics. Like this whole second part of the course is like answering those questions. It's, it's I, I'm so biased, but I think it's super neat. So sometimes that means that there's inefficient uses of these common resources, right? If we're using them unsustainably, then this is a very inefficient way to use it. So let's think about the inefficient use of a common resource. Let's, let's have it so that we have our marginal social benefit of these fish, right? So for like all the fish that we catch, there's some benefits that come to it, right? People get fed, they're pretty happy, but these benefits decline over time the more and more that we catch. That's just the idea of how demand curves work. Then we have our marginal cost. Notice that this says MC and not MSC. So 
this is our marginal private cost, not our marginal social cost. Well, at our marginal private cost, maybe we, if, if there's no one stopping us from going fishing and we really want as many fish to feed our restaurant as possible, we're gonna go out there. We're gonna fish all the fish out, right? We're gonna take as many fish as we need to be happy. So maybe when our private marginal cost equals our marginal social cost, in this situation, we would maybe catch 8,000 tons of fish and sell them for about $10 a pound, right? But that might be inefficient because if we just have everybody going and fishing, then we don't have as many fish the next period, right? So there won't be as many fish from people to fish from later. So in this situation, let's assume that the marginal social cost is actually really steep. And that's because if you start to use out lots and lots and lots of fish above the sustainability rate, then it's going to take longer and longer and longer to have a safe or a normal level of fish again. You might end up just driving them to extinction eventually. So let's say that we have this steep marginal social cost curve. This is the, the cost curve that we would consider if we had both our cost of going fishing and, and you know, producing the fish for our restaurant, but we also considered the environmental damage that we're doing by no longer having fish in the future period, or the, the damage that we're doing to our future selves because there won't be fish for us to fish later. Well, if we consider that, if we consider that, then where do we intersect with the marginal social benefit? If we take this marginal social cost curve in orange and look at the intersection with the marginal social benefit curve in blue, we see that if we really want to act sustainably, if we want to make it so that we still have fish in the future, we would really only take 300 tons of fish per year and we would sell them for about $15 a pound. The price would go up and the quantity would go down. That means that there's this deadweight loss triangle created. We know that because we can go to our original private equilibrium right here, trace a line up to our social cost curve, and we have this triangle. This is our marginal social cost. Notice in every single, I've already said this once, but I'm going to go ahead and say it again. Notice in every single one of these examples, we have manipulated the marginal social cost curve. That means on your homework and test, we're going to be manipulating the marginal social benefits curve. It's moving the benefits curve as opposed to the cost curve. Okay. Just, just so you know, just a heads up. Come by office hours if you don't understand. So we have this deadweight loss that's happening from overfishing. And noticing that's a lot of deadweight loss. Notice that this deadweight loss is to the right of our efficient equilibrium. That means that this is an overproduction because we have this negative externality of overfishing happening from using this common resource. We're actually taking more fish than we should. So we have this overfishing issue and that's deadweight loss that's resulting from trades that are happening now that shouldn't happen because it's damaging the future, right? So what can we do to achieve an efficient outcome? It's harder to achieve an efficient use of a common resource than to just kind of define the conditions, right? I can talk about it being great to clean the environment. I can talk about how great it is to stop overfishing, but like that's a lot easier to describe than it is to actually do, right? There's three main methods of trying to get to an efficient use of a common resource. First is property rights. So notice when you're fishing the ocean, there's, there's no property rights, right? Everybody can just go and they can fish in the ocean. What if we instead install property rights? We say, hey, this area of fishing actually belongs to this organization and you have to pay them a fee or talk to them to fish in this area. That's one way that we can correct for it. Another is production quotas. That's similar to the cap and trade idea we had earlier, right? Maybe we tell people we're cool with you taking 300 fish this year. Here's your permits. Everybody gets a permit for 10 fish. Trade amongst yourselves. And some restaurants that can easily switch to chicken instead of fish go to the ones that their seafood restaurants, they can't really switch. And they say, we'll, we'll sell you our permits. We'll sell you our permits. And you tend to get to a Pagovian situation where they trade amongst themselves. But the total number of fish that are fished are still at this cap. The other thing that we can do is individual transferable quotas. Very similar thing, right? I tell each single place, like, hey, instead of these permits that you're trading, I'm giving you a quota so you, you can fish 10 fish no more, you can fish 12 fish no more, and allow them to transfer in between each other. That's something that they can do as well. It's very similar to the production quota idea of having just one set amount of pollution. Instead, we give everybody their own set amount. So 
property rights is just one way to try to make it so that this marginal cost curve looks a little bit more like the social marginal cost curve because we install property rights. That means that someone's going to have to pay for the damage or someone's going to have some sort of vested interest in making sure that there's no longer overfishing because they own that area, right? This is one way we can correct. Another one's production quotas. That's the idea of the, almost the cap and trade, right? We say, hey, we're going to accept 300 fish being fished out and no more. No more, no more. Well, then some people are going to trade their permits to each other. Maybe some people are going to compete. Maybe the places that that can they can they can get the fish the easiest. They're going to go out there and they're going to try really really hard for those fish. There's no incentive to overfish this area to the right of the production quota line because it's too expensive to do so. It's very very heavily fined. So then, if we're just in this left part right here. Well, the cost isn't really down here where this marginal cost curve is. Instead, it's closer to this marginal social cost curve because we put in some sort of artificial regulation to cause people to act like they would under the marginal social cost circumstances. Finally, individual transferable quotas. So you really kind of just need to know what the basic idea of this one is. And it's just the idea of the production limits that are assigned to individuals, right? You at restaurant A can have 10 fish and you at restaurant B can have 20 fish and you at restaurant C can have 10 fish and kind of allow them to, to trade in between each other. This creates a market and it's a market for these quotas where maybe, for example, the restaurants that can switch to chicken or beef are much more willing to trade their quotas than the seafood restaurant that can only serve seafood is, right? So if we do this, that means that there's not only this marginal cost, this original marginal cost line, but now, now these restaurants or whoever else is fishing, they now have a price of these individual transferable quotas. And that's going to make them shift this line upwards so that it's closer to the marginal social cost because that price, that price of that individual transferable quota and what you're getting for it or what you're selling it for, that price is going to be similar to what the environmental damages or this external cost. It'll shift that curve closer to the marginal social cost curve which allows us to get to an efficient outcome where we would charge more for fish and fish less. So there's lots of different solutions that we can have. Now that's the negative externality side, specifically looking at production. Now let's go over to the positive externality side because it's not all doom and gloom, right? There's not always bad things happening in society. Sometimes there's good things. Like if I have a bunch of beehives and I have a beehive company, then all the farmers love it because their crops are better. Or maybe if I decide to make really cool bracelets out of plastic trash in the ocean, and I think they're just kind of cool and I sell them, well, then there's good of society of less plastic trash in the ocean, right? So let's talk about these positive externalities. A really good example tends to be education, right? So there's the private benefits to education. You're in this class because you want to make money, right? Like you want a job, you want to make money, you want to be happy, and like you're, you're doing those things. There's private benefits for you taking this class right now or consuming the goods and services of education. Your marginal private benefit, the extra bit of benefit you get to your life for extra every extra class that you take take or every extra like dollar you spend on education that's that's the good for you but there's an external benefit too right the more educated you are the better off your family is going to be because they're going to learn cool stuff from you the better off your friends are going to be because um, you're going to teach them about books and econ and theory um, the the better off your your children may be if your socioeconomic status goes up and you have a higher paying job you're better able to provide um, there could be other positive externalities of like if you're making smart decisions and you're really, really wise, you're less likely to get injured by like, I don't know, miscorrectly using a hair straightener or something. There's, there's benefits to society of an educated society. And these external benefits are the benefits that everybody else has because you're smarter and you've spent more time in education. So you have your marginal private benefit, what you really get out of this, and then there's the marginal external benefit. How much society is better off for each additional class you take, or how much better off society is for each additional year of school you go to? The marginal social benefit is going to be equal to this benefit that you receive plus the marginal external benefit, how much better off society is because you have this cool, super cool education, right? Or at least I'd like to think econ's super cool. If not, just lie to me. Like, just please lie to me. Uh, 
I'm fragile. Anyways, so we have our marginal benefit and our marginal external benefit, and then together we have the marginal social benefit. How better off society is because you have decided to pursue an interesting and fun, exciting class into microeconomics. So what does this look like, right? Okay, so notice that we're starting to talk about this benefit side here, or, or manipulating the marginal social benefit side. So in the production one, in the production one earlier, we, we manipulated cost. In this one, we're talking about the consumption side and we're looking at benefits, right? Because you're consuming education, you're using education, you're not producing it. If we were talking about producing education and like being a professor, then we would move that cost, that supply side. But now we're talking about consuming it. So you're using this good or service. If you're using this good or service, it's going to move this marginal social benefits curve. All right, so here we see that we have our marginal private benefit. That's this blue line. This is what you get back from education. Then we have what society gets back from your education. And that's this marginal social benefit. This is this marginal private benefit plus the marginal external benefit. How much like better off your family is and how much better off your friends are because you're telling them about cool books and how much better off your family is because you're teaching them about like how to do their taxes or something, right? There's this marginal external benefit which together equals our marginal social benefit. So let's talk about the positive externality of education. So we see that right here, right here at this, where this marginal benefit equals this marginal social cost, these two blue lines, we have the private equilibrium. It's actually inefficient, right? Because these are just the decisions when we don't think about how much better off society is. So you might go to school for maybe, or maybe 7.5 million people go to school for about $15,000 a student, right? But maybe, Maybe if we thought about the good of society and we had everybody educated to the point that society would want it, if we thought about all the good that's happening to other people, maybe instead we move up to this green line, this marginal social benefit line, and we see that we have an efficient equilibrium of education. If we were thinking about the efficient equilibrium, maybe 15 million students would go to school for $25,000 each because it is still more costly the more people you have in school, right? So the, so the cost would go up. Well, that means that this efficient equilibrium, notice that we have a new triangle. So we take our old equilibrium, trace it up to the marginal social benefit line, and notice we have a new triangle created. Now this triangle is to the left of the efficient equilibrium. That means that this is an underproduction. That means that we're really operating down where the marginal benefit equals the marginal social cost. That's less students going to school. But if we think about the social marginal benefit and the social marginal cost, it would actually be a lot more people going to school. So we have an underproduction where less people are going to school than what would be best for society. That creates this gray triangle. This is the deadweight loss that's occurring because there are people who should go to school but aren't going to school, right? So there's a couple government actions that we can take in this one. Let's talk specifically about education. Well, there's three things the government can do to try to get this, this amount, the, the private, the private um, demand and supply and the marginal benefit uh, where, where that is, the 7.5 million students, getting to the 15 million students that actually be best for society. There's three different ways that we can do that. Or there's more, but there's three that we're gonna talk about. First is public provision. So maybe, offering public schools. I mean, we're, we're at a public university, right? A lot of our funding actually comes from the government to be able to have these classes so that though we're charging you tuition, it's not nearly as high as tuition as it would be in a private institution because government's giving us some funds so that we can keep tuition reasonable, right? There's also the idea of private subsidies, maybe, maybe also being subsidized uh, to have private educations as well. Maybe there's voucher systems of letting you go to what school you want and you kind of have a ticket for like how much money is worth to that school. And you're like, hey, I'd like to go to your school. Here's my ticket for such and such voucher, right? So let's let's talk about how these can kind of make an efficient outcome, right? Let's illustrate the efficient outcome here. So we know that we have this marginal benefits line and we know that we have this marginal social benefits line. There's an, there's, there's an inefficiency that's happening because there's an underproduction of this good. So maybe instead, um, maybe buyers will pay this market price right here. Uh, this marginal benefit. And then maybe because there's a benefit to society, maybe we tax society and we put in taxes and these taxes are kind of paid by people out, by the taxpayers who get this external benefit. And therefore we kind of raise the amount of education up to this marginal social benefit line. That totally makes sense, right? Because 
how, how are you going to school right now? You're paying tuition and then a lot of money's coming in from the government. The money from the government comes from taxes. That's how we get from this marginal benefit where we would have less people going to school to this marginal social benefit where we actually have a lot more people going to school because that's where society would be best off of that number of people going to school. So we have these sorts of efficient outcomes where some of it might actually be paid for by taxes. We kind of call this a public provision. If, if we have taxpayer funded money and the taxes are based upon how much benefit society gets from you being educated and we instead use those taxes to be able to pay for additional resources such as public universities or public high schools or all these different sort of public schools. These payments or these government payments for goods and services of education is one way to publicly provide to try to make it so that more people would go to school. And though the cost is higher, part of that cost is offset by taxpayers, right? Because this amount is paid by taxpayers, the difference between 10 and 25 here. We also have the idea of private subsidies. Now, remember what subsidies are. Subsidies are the opposite of taxes. Taxes are when we kind of want people to do less of something, right? Subsidies are when we want you to do more of it. So maybe we could have a subsidy program. Um, maybe I'll go to you and say, hey, um, for every like $5,000 you spend on school, I'm going to give you a subsidy where I'll, I'll match you. I'll throw in another two. I'll throw in another 2000, right? That'd be a subsidy. A subsidy is a payment by the government to private producers. So let's say that you wanna to go to some private university and maybe, maybe you can't necessarily afford it, but society knows it'd be better if you could. So you can say, all right, I can pay this amount. I can pay like 5,000 and then society says, okay, all right, well, we're also gonna subsidize that. You pay 5,000, we'll pay 5,000. Together we have 10,000 you can spend on this private production uh, education. Right? So this is another way to try to bring this marginal benefit to what the marginal social benefit would be. I also have the idea of vouchers. Vouchers are just tokens, right? Um, voucher programs, that's the idea of like, I give you a token and you can take that token and it represents like, let's say $15,000. It represents $15,000. And you can go to the public school and you can hand them your token and they get $15,000 and they're going to educate you using that money. Or maybe you go to a private school and you give them the token and they get $15,000 and educate you for that money. Or maybe you go to the expensive private school that costs $22,000 and this token represents $15,000. So they get $15,000 for that. And then there's still $7,000 more you need for tuition and you pay the additional $7,000. These vouchers um, allow households to kind of choose the goods and services that are best for them. So is the public school best? Is the private school best? Is maybe the more expensive private school best and maybe just working really, really hard to afford that little extra bit of tuition because maybe that's where, where it'd be best for you. It allows choices to be made by the consumers, right? So that's the idea of voucher programs. Now, there's a lot of bureaucratic inefficiencies and government failures, right? So this would be great if the tax system worked perfect. The correcting for negative externalities by taxes would be great if taxes worked perfect, but they don't always, right? Are public provisions and subsidized private provision and voucher systems, are these all equivalent, like giving people a token versus uh, handing money to the school directly for you being there versus kind of just providing free high schools? These are not the same, right? Um, the behavior of bureaucrats, because remember we have two different people in government, right? We have bureaucrats and we have politicians. Politicians are elected, bureaucrats are appointed or hired. The behavior of bureaucrats are to try to maximize their budget. But when we combine this with rational ignorance of so sometimes it doesn't make sense to spend all of your time learning every minute detail of the bureaucratic budget, well, then, then if you as a voter aren't necessarily studying each and every single one of those things, but they want to maximize their amount of money for, for their department or their system, well, then we can get to another issue of government failure because maybe what happens and what would be best for society doesn't necessarily match in this way either. So it's just going to a different extreme. So we do have some problems with public provision, right? Um, I can guarantee there is no one watching this video who tells me that every single public school is equal in their ability to provide education and that they're equal in amount of funding because they're not, right? Public provision might lead to underproduction because bureaucrats seek to maximize budgets, right? Which means that some schools might get really, really padded budgets and they might have more money than they actually need. And that's when you get high schools with jumbotrons. And then maybe there's other schools that like the bureaucrats didn't necessarily want to put the money there. They'd rather have them at the place of the jumbotrons. So maybe they don't have the basic resources they need. And this leads to waste or inefficiencies or budget padding, right? So there's some problems with this. And then subsidies. 
giving people a subsidy of you can go to whatever school you want and for each 5,000 you throw in, I throw in 5,000. Like there's problems with that too. Like none of these systems are perfect. Uh, subsidy budgets have to be administered. So the person who goes around and pays the 5,000 each school, you got to hire someone for that. You got to hire a team of people for that. You got to hire banks. You got to have bank accounts. Like it's complicated. And all of those things have cost. That administration and compliance cost is expensive and it just makes things also inefficient. Um, so sometimes vouchers are a really cool idea. Are vouchers the solution? Um, there's there's a lot, a lot of research by economists on this. I think vouchers were even, it was with the kidney exchange um, papers that ended up winning a Nobel prize of like efficient ways to try to get organs to people who really need them. Uh, they, they were some of the starting foundations into vouchers. How, how do we use vouchers to get education to the people who really need them? So vouchers have a couple advantages, right? Over just the public provision of sometimes there's bureaucrats who aren't necessarily going to spend the money on the on schools that are efficient or schools that need the money versus private subsidies where it's very expensive to try to even administer this program to begin with. Vouchers, those are kind of interesting because I'm just handing you a token. I don't have to hire a whole bunch of people to hand you a token, right? They can be used with public provision. You can take them to the public school or you can take them to the private school, which kind of creates competition in between public and private schools. You can set the total value of vouchers. So I can say each one of those tokens are worth $15,000. Or I can say there's only 500 tokens out there in society, you use them. It's letting me set the total amount that we're going to spend on education. So it makes government budgets really known. Right. It also makes it so that we reduce bureaucratic overproduction because we we the bureaucrats aren't in charge of which school you go to. You get to choose which school you go to. Um, then vouchers end up spreading the public contribution thinly across millions of consumers. So if, if everybody pays just a little bit of taxes, it's better than some people paying a lot of taxes. Right. And then by giving power to final consumers, producers have to end up competing. So there ends up being higher standards of like better schools and better test scores and things. So vouchers are really popular with economists. They're not necessarily popular in the whole world, but economists who theorize and we look at the rational um, behavior of humans and how they operate in different situations, we actually really like voucher systems because it allows people to make their own decisions while also still keeping a certain level of benefit so that it's a predictable cost structure. But they're very controversial and opposed by a lot of education administrators and teachers, right? Because they don't like the idea that their paychecks are dependent on if you want to go there or not with your voucher token. So. Economists love them. Uh, education administrators, like principals, not necessarily as much, right? So there's still a lot to figure out. But that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about when it came to the idea of externalities, because I think those are just really neat examples of understanding how things that you may not even think about really affect the whole world. Whew, congratulations. We have now made it through chapter 17. You have officially finished the material for the second exam. So if I'm not mistaken, I think our exam is in about a week. So congratulations, we got this. Remember that we're going to come by my office hours if you have any questions. I'm going to have a review video. So you need to send me what you want in the review video in the next couple of days if you would like a review video. Um, I think that's it. Okay, well, I will see you at the midterm.